All right. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Dana Wilkos. I'm the health literacy educator for the New Orleans Public Library. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program, Using Your Influence, How a Flu Shot Can Keep You and Your Family Healthy, in partnership with the New Orleans Health Department. Uh, please be sure to check out nolalibrary.org for more virtual programming and resources, including our e-resources page where you can find books, uh, movies, and music that you can download and borrow for free with a New Orleans Public Library card. Uh, before we jump into tonight's program, I do have a few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, first of all, I, as I mentioned, I am recording tonight's session. It'll be available on the New Orleans Public Library YouTube page for you to reference later or to pass on to anyone you think might find it helpful. Uh, I'll put a link to that page in our chat. Um, I would ask that um, you put any questions you have during the session into the chat. We'll moderate those at the end. Um, and just you'll notice that uh, we've muted everybody upon entry and ask that you just leave yourselves muted. Um, any additional noise can be a bit distracting. Uh, and then with all that out of the way, I'm just gonna go ahead and hand things over to our moderator for tonight's discussion, uh, Dr. Jennifer Vegno. Uh, she's an emergency medicine physician and the director of the New Orleans Health Department. Dr. Vegno, thanks for being with us here today. Thanks, Dana. Great to, great to be here. Great to partner with the library um, and with uh, some of my colleagues and esteemed physicians around town. So great to have everybody here to talk about what's really a critical topic every year, but now more than ever. Um, so I want to thank all those of you who are listening and whatever or watching in whatever format to our panel. We have with us today uh, Dr. Meg Marino, who is our New Orleans Emergency Medical Services Deputy Director and and a pediatrician as well. And we also have Dr. Eric Griggs, community educator, physician, community health and wellness ambassador, and the, the man behind Get Fit, Get Checked, Get Moving. <laughs> get Checked, Get Fit, Get Moving, excuse me, Eric. Um, like, uh, like Dana said, I am an emergency physician and I am the director of the New Orleans Health Department and I'm gonna serve as the moderator. And tonight, our panel of experts are going to discuss the importance of ensuring your family is vaccinated against the flu with the additional risk that we face um, from COVID-19 this cold and flu season. Um, we, there's a lot we don't know yet about COVID. We do know that lots of viruses tend to uh, increase in prominence in the, in the fall and winter, and it's a real question mark as to whether COVID will be that too. So what we're facing is not only our usual flu season uh, with all the problems that can bring, but COVID as well. So to start off, we're gonna start with Dr. Marino from New Orleans EMS and talk a little bit about what happens if and when flu season collides with the coronavirus that we've been dealing with for the past seven or eight months. Um, and so Dr. Marino, Dr. Marino, I just wanna start by asking, you know, during the pandemic, uh, our state data and CDC, CDC data showed us a drop in routine vaccinations and well visits, particularly for children. So tell us as a pediatrician, why is it so important to encourage parents to keep up with their children's vaccinations, especially now? That's a great question. You know, I can completely understand a lot of families were really hesitant um, early on to go to um, doctor's appointments, especially for routine visits. And this is something that we have uh, initially, we encouraged, we said, you know what, things are, are really dangerous. Um, we, we need you to stay home. The healthcare system is overwhelmed. Please stay home unless it's an emergency. And that was in those first few weeks. Now we've gotten to a point where it's important that we continue to um, keep up with our health maintenance. And for children, it's especially important. Our, um, our routine health visits for children, especially those less than two years old, are so important, not just for vaccines, although the vaccines are very, very important, but those are our opportunities to check in with parents and kids, give them advice on the next developmental stages, um, help tell that mother of a nine month old that that child's gonna be walking soon and that she needs to really um, keep all of the uh, cleaning supplies out of reach um, and check to make sure that children are developing properly. And so those um, screening exams, those um, routine healthcare maintenance, 
visits for children while child checks are so important. Um, for kids who are not developing appropriately, it's our opportunity to intervene, get them the help and resources like physical therapy, occupational therapy, or speech therapy that can be vital in helping them to catch up so that that developmental delay does not affect them as they're continuing on in their development. So um, for older children, it's very important, again, for the vaccines, but also because that's the opportunity to, again, intervene, talk about developmental milestones. And so, um, you know, when we first were getting into this, when we thought that this was gonna be short-lived, we absolutely recommended that people stay home. Now that we're in month seven of this in New Orleans, we really need to make sure that we're getting all of the healthcare that we would normally get and that we do it in a safe way. Um, pediatric offices, are um, taking extra precautions. Um, so actually all healthcare agencies are. So um, we'll ask you to wear a mask. We'll take your temperature when you get there. We've set up um, chairs that are distant um, and taken um, additional cleaning precautions to make sure that we're not only cleaning spaces in between each patient, but also frequently throughout the day. Um, you know, everything that we do, we do to keep everyone safe and healthy. I think that's a great point. I think a lot of people might have a misconception that it's dangerous to go to a clinic or a hospital, but, you know, based on practical experience um, and seeing it firsthand, hospitals and clinics are really some of the safest places you can be uh, because everybody there really knows how how seriously how serious this disease and other diseases are and um, and they have very strict protocols so it's really safe to take your kids to the doctor or to get your checkup yourself absolutely and so you know like many people i have some children who still are not back in school they're doing virtual they're doing online um so so why is it necessary for parents to rush in and get their kids vaccinated if they're not going to be going back to school for another couple of weeks you know that's a great question it's something that people in my own family have asked me um i can understand how people usually think oh vaccines are just for school because for a long time that's the way we thought about them but um, really, these, these communicable diseases that vaccines prevent against, they are prevalent in our community. Um, and if we don't allow our children and bring our children for our routine vaccines on the recommended CDC schedule, we could see the resurgence of some um, of some diseases that we haven't seen routinely recently. So for instance, um, when I was doing a uh, residency in Colorado, there were a large number of families that chose not to vaccinate their children and we saw a very large um, pertussis outbreak. Um, we saw a measles outbreak just over the last few years. And so these are vaccine preventable diseases that kill children. And so I would hate to see an increase in these diseases um, out of fear. And um, the, the idea that it's only important if they go to school is, is false. It's really important if they're going to the grocery store, if they're playing with other kids in the backyard. Um, there are so many ways that children can, um, can come into contact with these diseases and it's not just at school. And so it's really important that we keep our children on their vaccine schedules. I'm gonna call an audible and, and ask Dr. Griggs, how would you answer that question if a community member tells you, um, no, my kids aren't going back to school till January, so I don't need to rush, you know, I don't need to rush and get them to the doctor or get their vaccine right now. I'll, I'll worry about it later. What would you say, Dr. Griggs? So uh, viruses and diseases don't go to school. Uh, they're everywhere. Uh, if you can remember a few years back, we had a measles outbreak at Disneyland. Uh, I mean, they're everywhere. <laughs> Before there was school, there were communicable diseases. So it's absolutely important uh, that people stay on the schedule to get uh, their vaccinations. Uh, these are not, they're routine things, they're safe things, um, and they're not anything to avoid for any reason. I mean, your kid can still get vaccinated if they, uh, if, if, I mean, still get diseases if they don't go to school. That's correct. Thank you. Um, let's focus a little bit more on the, the upcoming flu season. You know, every year uh, around the globe, we, we face flu season. Generally, we start to see the, the first 
um, large number of cases, you know, right now as the winter, as the weather turns colder, the flu circulates throughout the year, but it's more prevalent um, in, in the Northern Hemisphere and in, you know, America in the fall and winter. We all clinicians remember those years when we've had a really bad flu season. So a flu season where either lots of people were not getting vaccinated or it was a slightly different strain and more people were getting sick. And that, you know, those of us who work in clinical settings remember how strained our hospitals were during those bad flu years. So Dr. Marino, Tell us about some of the challenges that, that EMS, that hospital staff are, are preparing for, um, for the sort of double threat of flu and COVID at the same time. So on regular years, not when COVID is happening, our hospital systems and EMS systems are often stretched in the winter months. We'll have emergency rooms that are completely full, um, people who are hospitals that are completely full. Um, and it is, it is manageable, but it's tight. And so what we're worried about is that we've just, you know, we're just maybe starting to get better after our, um, our highest numbers with COVID. We're hoping that we don't see a rise in those numbers through because of mask um, initiatives and social distancing. However, we are Kind of preparing for for the worst and so we're worried that if we see a large number of people who contract covid who also um, have the flu um, that they will be very sick we know that flu and covid can coexist we saw some of that in march and april um, towards the tail end of the last flu season um, the other thing is that you know we usually will see a, a large number of people who are hospitalized with the flu and if that is overwhelming or you know, taking up our entire healthcare system and um, occupying all of our beds, um, what will we do as the COVID numbers start to rise again? And so we're very concerned about that. We've been preparing since March. Um, you know, our wonderful community leaders, yourself included, Dr. Vagno, have been working very, very hard to increase um, the capacity for our community. We've increased our um, hospital beds. We've increased our ICU beds. We've created um, extra spaces in our emergency departments. We've flexed and opened um, ancillary uh, spaces for caring for COVID patients, um, which has been really incredible to see that um, that increase. And you know, but we are a little bit worried that it may not be enough if we do see a, a large increase. And so. We are um, preparing, you know, preparing for the worst and really hoping that people get their flu shot to prevent the number of people who are hospitalized with the, with the flu. We are hoping that people continue to wear their masks. We are hoping that people will continue to social distance and wash their hands. And these are the things that will keep your family safe and happy and healthy. If we're able to reduce the number of people who are hospitalized with the flu and reduce the number of people who will contract COVID, um, hopefully, we will be able to um, get through this unprecedented time um, and help all of the people who do end up getting sick. So um, it's now more than ever is so, so, so important for you to get your flu shot. Yeah, I think, I think you, you really highlight what I, what I believe bears repeating every year. And that's that the flu is deadly and it sends people to the hospital. Dr. Griggs, can you just sort of, you know, comment on that? I think the message gets lost. I think we've done a good job of saying, get your flu shot and then you'll be okay. But I think a lot of people don't, don't see how deadly the flu is, especially now when we're so focused on how deadly COVID has been. So, okay. you know, for our, for our viewers, can, can you remind them how, <laughs> how serious the flu can be? Absolutely. And anyone watching or within the sound of my voice that has ever had the flu, I don't have to even speak to you. All you have to have do is have it one time and you'd be like, I will never not get a flu shot. I don't ever want that again. The flu kills between 36 and 50,000 people a year. Last week, the CDC came out and said that the number was 80,000, which is la the largest number. And that's just in the U.S., uh, the largest number uh, we've seen in almost 40 years. Um, the interesting thing about it is I know COVID that we're 215. The point is the flu is a killer and it can kill you. It will kill you. 
the, the flus that we're talking about is ironically, one of the ones we're most concerned about H1N1 is one that's the same one from 1918. 1918. Mm -hmm. And over the years, uh, you know, the viruses tend to become less, less, less lethal and more infectious, which means that they learn how to stay in the part of the human species party and uh, without killing everybody. Oh, if I don't kill a bunch of people, I can just stick around. Well, that bunch of people is a relative term because we're still talking 50 to 80, 80,000 people last year died from the flu alone. And the sad thing, it's something that can be prevented. Not only do we have the flu shots, but this year there's a there's an offhand chance that because we're masking, we wear a mask and we actually listen, we wash our hands now. Uh, Dr. Vegno, you've heard me tell people, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your nasty hands. If you wash your hand, I, we sing the ABC songs, little twinkle, twinkle, little star, whatever it is that you want to do. And most importantly, though, if you feel sick, stay at home. If your child feels sick, make arrangements now. Stay at, at home. If they're virtual schooling, isolate them. Again, if you've ever had the flu, it's the worst feeling in the abs. Oh, you, it's hard to describe, but you know you don't want to do it again. And a flu shot, something that easy, a little discomfort at the very beginning, uh, and maybe because your body, I, I equate it to, and as much as people try to accuse me of hating football, um, getting your vaccinations is like football practice. Basically, you got, basically you're, you're running the other team's plays for a practice run for a new, your immune system to know what to do. Uh, if it comes up to the, the actual flu on game day and you're prepared to win. And that's, that's just it. That's it. It's really that simple. And we know you love football, Dr. Griggs, as, as do we, of course. Um, Dr. Marino, so we've got the flu. We've got, the, we've got COVID. We're, gonna, we're facing two illnesses that, that have a lot of the same symptoms, fever and body aches and sometimes a cough. So how are some ways that um, someone can tell the difference? Is this COVID? Do I need to go get tested for COVID? Is this the flu? What should I do? So, you know, I've been getting these questions from my uh, friends and family. Um, I, what I've been telling them is you won't know. There are so many similarities. There are some people who will say, oh, I've just got a little bit of a runny nose and I'm not feeling great, and those people have tested positive for COVID. So the best way is to, if you're feeling bad, call your doctor, stay home, isolate yourself, and get tested for COVID. Um, the ways that you do that will differ based on where you are in the community, but there are so many free places to get tested right now, um, and we can um, definitely give you resources about that, but the, the key me message should be, um, if you feel at all terrible, go ahead and get tested. In kids, the, a lot of kids are asymptomatic and are just spreading the disease. So they could have just a little runny nose. Most kids will have a little runny nose for like six years, right? Like they'll just have a runny nose forever. And so <laughs> it's sometimes hard to tell, is this the regular runny nose that my kid always has or is this something different? And so if your child is having any symptoms, definitely go ahead and get them tested and call your doctor and talk to them about that. Um, children with COVID only will develop fever 50% of the time. And so they will also be more likely to have upper respiratory symptoms as opposed to adults who are more likely to have lower respiratory symptoms with COVID. We know that the flu and um, COVID will both make you feel terrible. They can both give you fever. They can both give you upper and lower respiratory symptoms. Um, they can both give you diarrhea. They can both give you belly aches. So while there may be some guidelines, I know the CDC has posted some things about this is more likely the flu, this is more likely COVID. Um, that can be helpful on a much larger scale for um, communities who are making decisions about policies and things like that. But for the individual, the symptoms are so similar and I don't think that there's a reliable way to tell, it, tell the difference. So um, if you think you're at all infectious with either one, they can both kill you and they can, even if they don't kill you, they can kill someone else in your community. So stay home, wear a mask, wash your hands and get tested for the flu and COVID. We have tests for both. Yeah, and, and while we're talking about both, so does the, the flu shot or the flu vaccine, what do we know about any possible effect that could have on coronavirus? Does it have any effect because it's a virus? Is, is there a reason not to get it, you know, if you're worried about coronavirus or what do we know about that? So the flu vaccine is um, a 
vaccine that is specifically targeted to the flu, the influenza virus. Um, so it will not prevent you from getting COVID. However, it will pre probably prevent you from getting the flu. And if you do get the flu, it will prevent you from being in the hospital or, or getting super, super sick from it. Now, while I, this vaccine will not prevent you from getting COVID, if you were to get the flu plus COVID, that would be terrible. And so even though it can't offer you protection from COVID at this point, we don't have a vaccine for COVID. Um, they're working on some and you know they're going through the proper processes to ensure the vaccine safety once that becomes available. Um, it, it will be available to everyone. It's not here yet. Um, right now, it's important that you get vaccinated against the thing that we can prevent, which is the flu. Um, and it's the best way to, to keep you healthy this, this winter. Yeah, I'd like to think of it as, as really a process of elimination. If, if you get a flu shot, as you said, you're far less likely to get the flu or it'll be mild. So if you wake up one morning really feeling terrible, but you've had your flu shot, the likelihood that it's not the flu is much higher. So, so you can then sort of use that in your decision making to say, oh, well, it, maybe it is really COVID. What have I been doing? Do I need to get a test? Do I need to isolate? So it just sort of takes the part of the worry um, off the table as to what is my sniffle? What is my body ache? What is my cough from, from today? And, and so why not? Why wouldn't you want to eliminate something that, that causes confusion? Right. Well, I thanks. can't. Oh, I was just going to say, I can't think of any reason not to get a flu shot. I, I really, anyone yeah. over six months of age should get their flu shot. Um, it's available at local pharmacies. You can get it from your doctor. You can get it from community flu events, um, flu, flu shot events. Um, and so definitely get your flu shot. And we'll talk, I'll, I'll mention this again at the end, but we are, there are going to be a couple of community-wide flu drives, flu shot drives coming up. Um, one that's going to be a big effort uh, between the city and, and our partners, um, going to be held the afternoon of o October 26th at the Audubon Zoo, and it's going to be drive through. Um, one of the things that that's going to help us do is, is take our drive through testing model that's been really successful and see how, how it works for a vaccination. And we're always thinking ahead if this works for flu. Um, can this work when a COVID vaccine is, is out and safe and ready to be given to everyone? We'll have others that'll be the traditional sort of walk up and, and get it. So in addition to all the other options that are out there with your healthcare providers and pharmacies and urgent cares, we'll be hosting some mass events as well. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Marino. I'm, I'm gonna um, put uh, Dr. Griggs a little bit more on the hot seat now. Uh, Dr. Griggs, you know, we've been talking about flu shots for a long, long time. You've been preaching the gospel on all of your media channels and, and you know, really helping to translate science to the community. Um, yeah. But we still struggle. We struggle with vaccination rates, um, not only across the country, but particularly in New Orleans and Louisiana. And our rates are not as high as they, they really need to be to prevent those deaths and those hospitalizations that we see every year. So can you talk to us a little bit about why influenza rates in New Orleans, Louisiana, and maybe even specifically in certain, certain areas of our community are consistently low. So yes, absolutely. So of course I found on my office wall, I found the wash your hands. This is from like years ago, years Love ago. It. We've been saying this for a long time. Washing your hands. First of all, it's really hard for people to believe something mm -hmm. as simple as washing your hands uh, and getting a flu shot can prevent, have that much impact. Uh, most people don't understand, like in today's day and age, uh, everyone's talking about vaccines. That's all we've been talking about is vaccines, vaccines, vaccines. And we're talking about vaccine trials and then they're being paused. And no one, they're not, people aren't really able to distinguish. Like today, so far we've talked about flu shots. But tomorrow and looking in other media, you'll be, hear everyone talking about flu vaccine. Get your flu vaccine. And everyone's like, I'm not taking a vaccine. I don't, oh, they, oh so they're experimenting with a flu shot now? No. Well, why didn't you say that to begin with? So it's a lot of uh, mis it, it, it's, it's not mis it's misconstrued information. Uh, it's good information. It's not misinformation or disinformation. It's just that we've been kind of, we, we, we've muddled the, the message in, during COVID now, and that's what we're working to fix. In the past, the reason is because it's been a distrust 
uh, due to a misunderstanding. Uh, in the African American community, there's just a history of not being trustful of the healthcare system. Now, you know, I live in the lane of health literacy. I try to take the complicated. I'll stay up all night reading something and talk about it for a minute so I can explain it so someone can explain it back to me. Um, just explaining and transparency in the process based on generational history. Uh, you hear about, you, if you, it goes way back, like hundreds of years to experiments being done on different races. Um, they, then the, the myths come out. Uh, you know, then there's that whole campaign based on that false study about the uh, vaccines causing autism. And that, I mean, we all know the long history of that being false and the damage that that, that did. So um, it, it's just transparency and it's really, it's health literacy, meeting people where they are. In the sender receiver message equation, everyone assumes that because we go to school and get smart and we talk to the, the community that they, they should understand everything that we say as opposed to the, the vital part that we leave out, leave out is the feedback. The whole purpose of us talking to the community and that sender receiver equation is to be there, there to be a mutual understanding when you walk away. So we have to be transparent enough and patient enough to give it to the people that we're trying to help so they can give it back to us so they can go out and carry the message that we're trying to get to them from, from the data. And that's been part of the distrust over the years. Like literally, <laughs> I've literally been asked, Doc, if I, if I wash my hands, I don't have to take a shot. <laughs> you have to do both. Did, did my daughter ask you that? Because I bet. <laughs> no, I think you bring up a great point. As, as physicians, as doctors, as healthcare professionals, we really, a lot of times, aren't good at communicating in the way that our patients really want or need to hear. We're real good about, you know, using all kinds of scientific terms that, you know, we, we went to school for and so we're very proud that we know what they mean, but we're not good at translating. And we're also sometimes not good at being honest and admitting, yes, in the past, there yes. were a lot of things done in the name of science that were, uh, you know, completely Horrible. wrong. Yeah. And we are aware of that. We acknowledge it. It is not how, who we are today. This is not one of them. And how can I build your trust by walking you through what, why I think this is important so that you, you can trust me that this is not one of those times? Yeah, the, one of the biggest things, the, the, the way things that's kept me most honest is uh, empathy. Um, putting myself in the place of the community. Doc, have you gotten your... If you get a vaccine and it's rushed through, would you take it? No. Uh, Doc, have you gotten your flu shot? Not yet, but I'm taking it. Well, we want to see you do it. So it's accountability, transparency. It's like going to someone's house and they don't eat their own food. Well, I, I want to eat what you eat. What's, what's wrong with your food now? Again, finding ways to connect with our audience. And each audience is different. Uh, if we go, if I go home to North Carolina and talk about crawfish, they're not going to know what it is. If I say crayfish, they're going to think bait and go to try to go fishing. They wouldn't eat it. So each audience is, is different. So the messaging, even though the message has to be the same, but the messaging has to be different. And then you tie the data to the message and you get people to give it back to you. And it's amazing what you can learn from, from the community. Yeah, and so tell us about some of the creative methods that you've used to outreach to the community, to get buy-in, to get champions, because you're just one guy. And even if you're on every you know, media station, you, you can only do so much. But what we're trying to do is build trust so that that, you know, on every corner, there's somebody who has heard you, understands you, trusts you and is spreading the message. So what, what kind of things have you done to really, you know, get get folks to be more accepting of vaccines? So one of one of the, the, the big things uh, that we do is, uh, you know, on Fox and when I'm on television, we, we do uh, public flu shot. There was one year that uh, I got skipped because they didn't bring enough and everyone told me I was afraid. So I had to follow up on social media. And so I wasn't afraid. But the biggest thing is you empower the people you stop, you go to different groups, you offer, I mean, I offer and everyone knows that they want me to come speak to them. Okay, I'll come to speak to large groups and you empower them in churches at the uh, community groups uh, that you see. Uh, we, I, we, you know, we, you helped. We, uh, we opened up the community center. Uh, we empower the students, and I tell you, as reluctant as people are to any messaging that we might give as, as doctors, if you say that I'm bringing the students and can you help them uh, learn how to teach y'all, it's amazing how, when, once you put kids, I call them kids, and I'm just, 
it's just hard for me to believe I, I don't have hair and I'm calling a 22 year old, a 21 year old, a kid. But once you, you engage the community to help uh, the process, they really, really want to take the message and they, they elevate you. What you give the community, they give back a thousand fold. Um, there's some things, of course, I partnered with the city, partnered with you. Uh, and a lot of the things this year, I really am thinking about dressing up like Santa Claus and being a, a, a Dr. Flu Claus and giving out <laughs> flu shots, just engaging it, making it fun, stimulating the alpha neuron so people can relax and understand that we're all in this, we're really in this together. Um, and there's a reason that we're doing it. Transparency Dr. is the big thing. And Dr. Mar Dr. Marino, you know, what have you seen sort of from pediatricians who have, you know, maybe used some creative ways or, or reached out to the community or, or gotten, gotten the word out other than just, you know, when you come in for your well checkup, giving you that shot? What, do you, what are pediatricians doing? So I think this year, pediatricians have a much harder job because usually they're able to um, communicate with their patients on a regular basis. But this year, because a lot of people haven't been going to their regularly scheduled uh, wellness checks, um, they haven't had that opportunity. So they have had to be a little bit more creative. Um, I've seen a lot of social media campaigns put together just by um, residents, um, uh, physicians that I, that I went to school with, um, who are out there really just sit, telling their friends and families um, and their communities, get your flu shot. Um, I've seen people just kind of, you know, talking to their um, PTA groups. I've seen um, pediatricians talking to their neighbors. Um, a lot of people are saying, um, you know, our kids can't play together even outside socially distanced if um, our communities aren't getting their flu shots. And so, um, you know, it really has been a lot of, you know, communities holding each other, you know, community members holding each other accountable. Um, I got my flu shot and I made everyone in my family and I've been, you know, uh, I, I don't want to say harassing, but maybe a little bit harassing everyone in my family to get their flu shot um, and to get it early, not wait until December or January, that now is the time. Um, and I've been telling all of my friends who have kids, you know, really make sure you're getting your, your flu shots early. So it's, it's definitely been a little bit more difficult this year, but definitely it's all about just getting the message out. Yeah, and I think it's really a grassroots approach this year more than, than many other years. We had started a few, like, yet yeah, last year, showing up at places where people were. So we, we parked ourselves at the aquarium and the zoo and we asked every parent that came by, hey, do you wanna get the flu shot now? And the parents said, oh yeah, we were gonna do it, but we didn't have time. Of course, the kids were not so happy about it, but <laughs> it was really meeting people where they are. Or Eric, I know, you know, there, there's been a lot of places here included that have um, utilized barbers, beauticians, where you go and you sit and you chat and you know the person and you trust that person and you can have a real conversation that maybe a pediatrician doesn't have time to have that long conversation, but that barber sure does. And by the end of the day, maybe the, maybe the barber is the one that, that our patient will trust you know, more than the pediatrician. And so it's, it's really meeting people where they are and, and being on the streets and doing it everywhere. You know, uh, one of the th things that, that the, the, the real things is, that, as I'm sitting here thinking, is we live in, we're living in a time where we, a lot of people, we, we feel helpless. Uh, the coronavirus is, uh, fatigue is setting in. They're like, oh, I can't do anything about it. You know, messaging people and, and letting them know that this is actually something you can do. This is something you can do for yourself to protect yourself. Um, that, that there might not be a vaccine for COVID-19, but get your regular flu shot and it, it's empowering. Well, let's talk a little bit more, you know, about that. And let's talk about just sort of the disproportionate impact that, that not only coronavirus has had, but, but that the flu threatens to have as well. So early on in the pandemic and the numbers continue, you, we saw our African-American and our Hispanic residents both here and across the country disproportionately affected by coronavirus in terms of infection, in terms of hospitalizations, mm -hmm. and in terms of death. So what, what do we expect this infection rate to do? We, you know, we've, we've really come a long way. We've, um, our residents are you know, crushing COVID in a way that most cities could only wish. Um, which is, you know, again, another reason to be proud to be a New Orleanian. 
but we cannot ignore the the inequities that were laid bare and we can't just act as if they're not there you know we we have to actively fight against making them worse so so how does you know how does that the flu how does that play into what might happen as we move through the coronavirus pandemic while we wait for a vaccine in terms of a disproportionate impact so uh, it's an excellent excellent question the 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 thing is the same issues still exist. We've done a great job. Uh, we have gotten a lot of the community trust, but we still have to worry about access. Uh, there are a lot more people that are impoverished. Uh, there are a lot more people without jobs. It is a social economic thing. Um, it is being able to social distance is somewhat of a privilege. Uh, and the flu uh, transmits much like COVID does. Uh, some people don't have the luxury of being able to live in places where they can actually social distance. So it's access to care. It's exactly what you said, meeting people where they are, not only with the healthcare, but with the information and literally spending the time to make sure that everyone understands. You and I have common friends around the community center that love us and that will help. And what happens is as you pull your, your, your troops and the members of your community in, your champions, and empower them and trust you, they take the message out. So it's going to take more of that uh, there was a, there were, we were fighting a lot of myths early on, uh, and particularly in the African American community uh, with COVID, because uh, there was a myth going around that uh, African Americans were immune. When in April, it turned out to show the exact opposite here in Louisiana, 70% of the, 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 the people that passed away were African American. So you had to fight the myths. Well, we're fighting how many decades of myths of vaccines and flu. So we have to be careful with our messaging. We have to meet people where they are. We have to continue the fight uh, to uh, bring pe give people access to healthcare. And again, informing people of when you should go to the doctor. I thought it was excellent um, that Dr. Marino brought up that you know, the, you know, the difference is, it, it's gonna be, kind of be hard to tell. You can't really tell, but you need to go and, and, and get, go to the doctor and get tested for both. I think our city has done, hats off again to you, we've done an excellent job of providing access to flu shots, I mean, uh, to, to COVID, to COVID-19 testing. I mean, it's we've, we've, we've done them everywhere and people are still hitting me up, where do you go? Well, I'm like, and I send them to ready, uh, ready, ready.nola.com, ready.gov, I say it so much. Um, but just to be able to, to, to take that out of the uh, decision tree is, is important, but letting it's the information and meeting people where they are and continuing to have the public trust and being honest, whether people wanna hear it or not, being as honest and transparent as we are is, is, is gonna be key. And Dr. Marina, from, from the EMS side, you know, you, you, your team gets to go all over the city and really sort of sees how, how different areas of the city, how different neighborhoods have been affected or not affected by the coronavirus. And, and how, how do your folks sort of in that moment on the ground, how, how are they sort of helping to continue to get the message, yes, it's okay to take you to the hospital, yes, you know, we want to get tested for this, it, you know, how, how do they do that messaging so that, again, we're not reproducing these inequities that we've seen? So it's been hard. There are a lot of people who, when um, the ambulance arrives, they say, no, I don't want to go to the hospital. I'm not dying. I don't need to go to the hospital. And, um, you know, part of that, I think, is from fear of, of COVID. But also, I, I think a lot of it is from fear and mistrust of the, um, of the medical community that has been really just so deeply rooted in a long history of just like you said, some some terrible things that that were done in the past, and um, you know a lot of it is about building trust. We have been um, really working hard to improve our relationships with our communities. One of the initiatives that we just started is the diversity officers, and that's a a group of paramedics who um, whose goal it is to. Um, improve relationships with different members uh, or members of different communities within New Orleans and improve our abilities to um, communicate with them, meet, meet them where they are, and um, show them that we are, are here to help and keep them healthy and, and really help them. And so, um, you know, we're just getting off the ground with this effort right now, but um, we have done some messaging with, uh, it was Hispanic um, Heritage Month, 
um, just recently. And so we had them, um, uh, some of our uh, Spanish speaking employees make a video that went on social media um, in Spanish to try to do some outreach to our Hispanic community. We are doing some similar outreach with um, different communities throughout New Orleans. And um, we're hoping that through um, these kinds of uh, efforts that we will really Im improve people's um, trust in us. But um, really when we show up at someone's house and knock on their door um, to provide them with healthcare, um, just kind of that empathy that Dr. Griggs was talking about a, a few minutes ago, that's the most important thing. And if we can um, show up with some empathy and listen to their concerns, and when they say, I don't wanna go to the hospital, say, tell me about that. Why don't you wanna go to the hospital? I can understand why you would feel that way. If you can just talk to them and listen and really get to the root of their concerns, um, and help them to understand why it's important that they get the care that they need um, and show them that you're on their team, it can really go a long way. And so that's what we're trying, that's what we're trying to do um, every day. I think Dr. Griggs might want to get with you on the diversity uh, officers. I think I was like, wait, I'm all there's in some great, yeah, I knew you, I could, I could read your mind. I know there's some great <laughs> cross pollination that could happen there. Yeah, let's um, do it, Dr. Griggs. I'm in. Yeah. Dr. Griggs, I'm going to ask you my last direct question to you is, is kind of the fun question, but it's hard. Um, yeah. You know how we do in New Orleans. Yeah. Oh, we yeah. love parties. We love being out in the street with everybody. We are social people. We hug, we dance, we love. Um, and, and those are the things, you know, like many of our, our friends and neighbors in Europe, those are the things that unfortunately really cause, cause us to have, caused us to have high rates of hospitalization and death, right? Because that this, this virus is, um, a tricky thing. And um, so for New Orleans, it's a lot. That's why I think our, our, you know, success has been remarkable. It's a lot harder for us to stay six feet away from each other than it is for a whole lot of people. You know, how, how do we stay safe as we're, you know, in this kind of period for a while now where we, we can't really do the things that we love, um, but we we know the danger that comes with letting our guard down, whether it's COVID, whether it's COVID and the flu. How do we keep ourselves safe, but also still be true to who we are? So I start, I'm going to start uh, low and build back up high. Um, throughout this process, I think, you know, I, I quit. I think my last tally when I talked to you was three or four. Uh, I've lost 10 people uh, to this virus, and I've not not attended one funeral, um, not even the Zoom. Uh, a is scheduling, but but B because the CDC uh, just I saw it just today. They came out and they said small gatherings are responsible for the number of cases going up. I think the message with super spreaders has gone up. At the very beginning of this, I mean, it was just tragic. Uh, just on social media, it was traumatizing to watch your friends go through all of this, the the the, the damage and the the hurt. Um, because people are, are dying. They know that this disease can, can kill. Um, with that said, when I talk to people, I'm like, you know, is this the practice? Like, what are you talking about? Are y'all practicing for the repast? I'm like, so in New Orleans, we know what a repast is. We know what a second line is. You can either do this now for the, as a practice for the wrong thing or just wait and just work with us because we're hurting too and we can do this. In the, I tell people to imagine the party we're going to have when this is all over. Um, so you... You start with very real and you bring it home. I mean, I've uh, close friends, healthy friends. It's almost traumatizing sometimes. I'm not sure if it's happened to any of you, but people have to understand that, you know, we're out here giving the message and reading the data and you're taking, you're taking care of patients, y'all are just, and EMS, you're doing everything, but we're people too. And we have families and we have friends and we have friends. I have a cousin, a first cousin just got diagnosed yesterday. So I've been in North Carolina, and I've been talking her through the entire process, keep being as upbeat as possible, you know, on the other side of this, we're going to all end up okay. It's just, you know, y'all can either have this party now, or we can talk about what we did, and how much make fun of it. So it's a, that what we did during this time. So what it, it's, it's a matter of putting it in context, and keeping people 
light enough to understand so they'll cooperate. And it's amazing. Now, I know I'm not the only one on this panel that have had family members that were total skeptics at the very beginning. They might not have gotten it. Some of them got it. And now they're the biggest, oh, no, 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 baby, back up. Mm -hmm. Six feet, back, wear your mask. <laughs> they might be making masks for you. So again, when we give it to the community, we, we talk it, give it to them uh, so they can give it back and let them digest it at their own pace. Um, New Orleans, you know, we're pretty proud. Like we will, we will wear it. We will, I, ooh, ooh, just, all we do is have to give it to us and we'll put our own flavor on it. So that's, that's what I say. So just, and, and people get it, they get it. And they know that when, uh, Doc, I know that you've had some people like, I know, I know we're wrong. I'm sorry, I, 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 my bad, my bad. <laughs> what do you need me to do? And that, that's who we are as New Orleanians. We're genuine. And once we get it, uh, we, we, we own it. So that's, that's the messaging. I start low, go high, and I give it to the community. And they give it back, yeah. good and bad, let me tell you. Yeah, and, and that's important. And, and Dr. Marino, you know, you, you deal with little people. You deal with kids. I think one of the things that I've noticed is how kids have done, you know, it's been really hard for them. But in terms of doing all the things that we need to do to get through, wearing a mask and understanding why they can't, you know, play with this person close or being on the playground, they've gotten it really quickly. So what, what do you think kids can teach us about how we're going to get through this with our, with our sense of self and, and humor intact? You know, I think kids are so funny because they don't want to do anything, right? Like we're <laughs> imposing, they don't want to wear pants either. It's like, no, you, you have to wear your pants and you have to wear your mask. Right. And so um, they've been really adaptable because they just see it as another rule. Well, okay, I guess I have to wear my pants and I have to wear my mask. Um, but also they can, you know, you can say, okay, yes, you can have one friend in, in, you know, in your bubble, right? You can have one friend in your bubble. It's the child who lives next door. Um, we know what the, um, risk tolerances of the other family. We know that they're not um, uh, going to big sporting events every weekend with a lot of people. Um, and they can have their very best friend play in the backyard pretty regularly, right? And so there are ways that you can do, um, do fun things in a, in a safe way. Also, kids are pretty easy. Sometimes they just want to play with a box for a few hours. <laughs> and so sometimes it's just about finding a fun way to present the situation. If you're bummed out about it, um, I know sometimes it's hard to put on a brave face for kids. I, I know that the, the families, especially, I think about um, the, the parents who are working and working from home and haven't had a, a chance to breathe and they're taking on now working from home, virtual schooling, everything. I, I understand that it's hard to put on a brave face after, after, you know, now we're in month seven of this, but if there is a way for you to have a positive attitude about COVID with your kids. Talk to them about how it's the, it's the responsible thing to do. We owe it to our community to wear a mask. Um, kids will follow your lead. They will, um, they will do what they're supposed to do um, if you are open and honest with them and present it in a way that makes sense to them. Um, you know, most kids will, will follow the, uh, the instructions. And you know, this isn't to say that they won't forget sometimes, just like adults sometimes forget, but you'll say, oh, I see your nose. Better put your mask on. Um, I've got your nose, right? So you can make it fun, but, um, but it's, it's so important. You know, we've seen so many complications from COVID that we're still discovering. Um, and there are some serious complications for kids with COVID too. So even though they've seemed to have been pretty resilient through all of this, um, it's important that we protect them and that we protect each other. For sure. Um, well, this has been a great discussion. We've just, we've got time enough, probably just for one more question to you, to you both. And, and it's, you know, I'll start with you, Dr. Marino. How are you as a physician, as a community leader, you know, as a leader of EMS, which is such a critical part of our city's public safety, 
how are you going to use your influence? How are you already using it to get the word out about flu vaccinations to, you know, keep people, you know, get, get everybody in our community engaged to really think, let's do this. It's just one small step in our fight, not only against the flu to COVID. What are you, what are you doing? So that's a great question. And I'm definitely stepping up my game after this conversation. But um, what I've been doing is just having real conversations with just about everyone I come into contact with or everyone I, I, um, I have a Zoom meeting with or everyone I have a, a phone call with. Did you get your flu shot? And so that's the, that's the first part of it. The second part of it is follow up, not just showing them where to get their flu shot, telling them, but saying, after you get your flu shot, will you let me know? I care about you. I want to make sure that you're happy and healthy this year, and I don't want you to get sick. I love you, and I don't want you to die from the flu. Um, and that is really compelling. Some people don't want to get the flu shot to protect themselves, but will do it for somebody else. And so um, I won't call them out by name, but there is one person in my family who um, – is a little bit um, reluctant to get the flu vaccine. And um, this might be a little bit of an overshare, but I almost died from the flu uh, three years ago. And um, after that, I brought him to the pharmacy and he came and got his flu shot. And I was like, this is something that's really important to me. And this is how you can, you can help me from getting sick. And so I think, you know, sometimes people won't do it for themselves, but they'll do it for somebody else. And so if you say, you know, I would really hate it if grandma got sick, um, you know, do you think you could get your flu shot for grandma? Um, or I would really hate um, for you to get sick and get, get your sister's new baby sick. Um, can you get your flu shot? And so um, framing it in that way, a lot of times people won't do things for their own well-being, but they'll, um, they'll do it for, to, to help somebody else. We've all got a lot of good in us and um, this innate uh, want to help people. And so I think sometimes that can, um, that can help bring people to make a good decision for, um, for their own health. Yeah, that's that's a, a great point. And I think, you know, thank you for sharing your story. I think stories are incredibly important, particularly for those people who say, oh, well, it's not a big deal. You can say, but wait, let me tell you my story. Um, and now, you know, with COVID, I think we are in the mindset of I'm wearing my mask to protect you. So this is just another way that we extend that. So it should be right now, it should be sort of reflex for us right now. And that's a great way to, to, to use your influence. Um, Doc Griggs, how about you? How are you, how are you getting the word out? So, so uh, outside of, I, I am going to different organizations and setting up flu shots for different campaigns through, you know, I work at Access, uh, we set them up. Uh, but you also know, but this is October, and I am ready and prepared. With the costumes. With my costumes, and I have, believe it or not, I have flu shot vouchers. Um, that I, It's October. I have flu shot vouchers, and if you catch me, this is a reindeer, and I have several others that you will see. Uh, if you catch me right, I'm going to give vouchers for free flu shots for people that don't have insurance across the city. This has got antlers. Um, but uh, meeting people where they are uh, and really diffusing any anger with a smile or any, 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 any uh, fear or anxiety with a smile um, to let people know that this is something that they can do for themselves. And talking about it every time I possibly get a chance, um, publicly getting a flu shot, I'm due this week uh, to post it on social media. Don't know how I'll quite be dressed, but yeah, I, uh, just meeting people where they are anytime uh, that they'll listen. And, and to great effect, having, uh, having watched you get a flu shot on TV personally, it's, uh, it, if that doesn't make somebody want to do it, I don't know what does. Um, well, this has been, this has been great. Thanks everybody for participating. We hope that this is going to be in, um, you know, informative. We're going to post it on social media widely so anybody can tune in. Thank you to Dana and our partners at the New Orleans 
library for coordinating the panel. Um, you know, I just want to remind folks that last year in September, we saw record breaking early flu like activity um, that, that really was sort of the worst in the nation for a while there. And that was last year <laughs> before we even had COVID. So, so this is, you know, this is the real deal. Like I said, we'll be doing a citywide drive uh, October 26th. Autumn and Zoo, stay tuned for more information about that. We have other, our partnership with the Louisiana Department of Health and the state, they're gonna be doing multiple different uh, flu drives. Uh, we wanna make it easy, accessible. So please do what you have to do, come to our drive, go out and get it, but get it soon. Uh, and I wanna thank everybody. Please stay healthy, stay safe. Please wear your mask, stay six feet apart, and of course, wash your hands. Thanks everyone. Wash your, wash your hands. Thank you. Thank you.